morning. Hope uh, everyone is doing well after this uh, kind of cold, uh, drizzly night. Uh, it feels like we're back in, <laughs> in October, but uh, it's a lovely, lovely day. We're alive, and that's what matters, right? So uh, we pray and hope that you had a wonderful Mother's Day uh, with your family members, maybe in a different way as before, maybe through the phone, maybe through uh, Zoom or, or or FaceTime or whatever, but um, we pray and hope that all of you had that opportunity to call your mother, or if you don't have your mother, uh, to, or if you're a mother, to be, have, to have been called by your children and your friends, and uh, so, yeah, do you guys have a chance to talk to your mothers or the mothers you know of, or uh, any experiences? Did I saw my mom on Saturday. I, I come from a family of eight, so I figured, you know, she's covered, you know, a lot on Sunday. So I, I was able to visit with her on Saturday. That's awesome. Um, I have a great picture of my mother, and it, it goes way back, um, but it's, uh, it's when she was a um, very young woman, and long before she ever met my dad, and it sits on my uh, sits on my nightstand, and I have the opportunity to say good night to her every night. But um, but there was just uh, something about uh, she has a very captivating smile, and and I I've come over the years to appreciate that smile since really that is the 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 best memory I have of her is continuing memory is being able to. To see that beautiful smile in that picture, and it, uh, it warms my heart every time. So, uh, just re reconnecting there as well, and and all the other um, mothers and young mothers uh, in my life had a had a chance to connect with them. So it was good. That's awesome. So my mom loves uh, uh, flowers, or like plants, really. The, mm -hmm. the plants, and because she loves gardening, and so. She's always working in the backyard of, of our gardening. And I went to see her on Saturday as well. And, and my plan was to stop at a, a, at a greenhouse, greenhouse or, or flower, tree, shop. flower shop. And so I was told of one here in Manitowoc near, I don't know where it was near, but we, we walked to it and we couldn't find it. So I went to mom and told mama, <laughs> I had the intention to bring you flowers, but I didn't find them. And uh, I think uh, that was Saturday, and then my brother on Sunday took her to the nursery somewhere in Green Bay and bought a, a bunch of flowers for her. So uh, he made me look bad. <laughs> oh, he helped you look good. Uh, <laughs> um, man. But at Mass, she was watching the Spanish Mass I had, and then she uh, appreciated that I, I prayed for her and, uh, and all the mothers in our family. So. It was, a, it was a great day, definitely. Um, so it was not just Mother's Day, but also the opportunity to log into the Theology of the Body Conference. I don't know if you had an opportunity to sign up to that, to take a look at some of the, the, the conferences, the videos. Uh, there were a ton of them. Uh, a lot of different speakers, a lot of different topics, um, all connected somewhere, somehow, some shape to the Theology of the Body or St. John Paul II's uh, teachings. Uh, did you guys have an opportunity to take a look at any of those videos? I did, very much. Um, as many of you who signed up for it realized, it was a mountain of, of, of video, which I know made navigation a little bit difficult and made it so you kind of had to sample them here and there, but but there were some real gems to be found in there if you had the, the patience to to look for it, um, and some that were very close to home. One of the most poignant uh, recollections of, of John Paul II and his sort of vocational charism came from uh, very near to us, Bishop Hying, uh, the, the recently named new Bishop of Madison, who is a Wisconsin boy from, from the very beginning, but but he credits John Paul II as the, as sort of the the the, the seed of his uh, of his vocation, and and it gave a beautiful uh, witness to that. 
Um, and then some of the young, dynamic uh, speakers uh, of our day, like uh, Chris Stefanik from Real Life Catholic, and, and, uh, uh, and, and many, many others. Some really profound talks, uh, Jan Dr. Janet Smith, who for years was on the faculty of Sacred Heart Seminary in Detroit, um, and has been on the forefront of the dangers of, of, uh, of um, artificial contraception and, and gave a, um, a very scientific, but at the same time, like Dr. Smith is, just beautifully well-presented, detailed, and, and, why, um, and why the church teaches what it does, uh, something more than just rules and regs, but something truly for the, uh, for the good, the good uh, goodness and health of, of, uh, of humanity. So, to, there was, there was greatness wherever you looked. But you, even if you had to dig a little for it. Oh, absolutely. One of my my favorite ones was from uh, Father John Burns. Mm, Johnny uh, Burns, yeah. Father John Burns is the now he is the associate vocations director, I believe, in Milwaukee, yeah. and. Uh, we, that's where we went to seminary, and uh, in our time there, he was in Rome doing his doctorate and suffering, I believe, or something. Can't remember exactly what his uh, his doctorate is, but nonetheless, he's a, a a priest beloved by by us, by a lot of people in Milwaukee. Just very smart, and so his talk on, on theology of the body was called the restoration of the garden, mm -hmm. and he was using some of the passages from Genesis to reflect the beauty of. Our sexuality, the beauty of our body, what St. John Paul II was, was going after. And just like the differences between males and females and how we all, like, in our own way, like, embrace the beauty of our creation. It's just, uh, it was very, very moving. It's probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite of that weekend. And I think the other that probably you all picked up on as well is that the mix of the speakers, um, there was everything from from those with with in, incredibly advanced degrees, all the way down to those who simply are good, faithful, spirit-filled souls who were able to, whose lives were changed in some way or another, either through John Paul II or through theology of the body, and so the spectrum of those who were able to speak and witness and 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 you have to give credit to the organizers for. For a full spectrum, a full slate of those who, who were who they gave the opportunity to speak, and um, um, there was a there was a, a thread of, of similarity through all of them, but 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 the breadth of the the talks should have been well appreciated, I think. For sure, you heard from like catechetical stuff, from conversion stories, like uh, uh, what's her name? Um, I wrote it down. Leah Darrow talked about her own conversion story and how our Lord broke through her own life and heart and it's just beautiful to see like uh, you had all ages as well from young to oh, wiser mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right and, and uh, it was just it, it was a lovely lovely talk some of the people that you uh, would know as fact are famous that are well known like Jeff Cavins uh, Christopher West uh, Jason Everett uh, uh, Matt Fraud uh, Chris Stefanik, uh, just a bunch of really good, solid, solid people, including our own local uh, Peter superstar. Yes, yeah. right. That's right. Absolutely. So, um, we gave a truly good talk on the dignity of work. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> that's awesome. So, yeah, plenty of stuff. Hopefully, you had a chance to take a look at it. Uh, and I don't know if this was planned, but uh, this conference was put on Mother's Day. Um, like the beauty of motherhood, the beauty of giving life with the idea that the teachings of the church, the teachings of uh, what St. John Paul II brought into the table, the beauty of our sexuality, that we as, as, as Catholic Christians do not separate the body and the soul, but they're a, a bunch, and that the soul is not only good, but the body is also good and holy and beautiful, and how like all the emotions that come to us are always pointing us to a deeper desire in our hearts, that are pointing us to like, which is, we were built, to be given as a gift to someone other than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that ultimately is God, right? Some of us do it through celibacy in the priesthood, in the religious life. Some of, 
some of other people do it in, in the beauty of marriage and what that means and that complementarity of spouses and sexes that in their in their love are able to produce life and the children become the fruit the tangible fruit of their their love for one another and how that brings them and binds them together so beautiful wonderful uh, conference um, maybe some of you had the opportunity to buy the premium pass and maybe you'll have the opportunity to go back and, and revisit uh, some of those might be worthwhile yeah, I'm not sure that even if we had listened 24 hours uh, a day from the time the conference started till it ended last night that we could have gotten through all the talks um, it just that's that's how how deep it was I think I only if any I only watched like glance or watch through like half of at most I think uh, but it's worth it um, there's also a few other conferences coming up as well that are free I know a chastity project Jason Everts uh, is it Everts? Everts? Ever. yeah he I think his project is putting a, a free conference coming up um, <coughs> the, don't quote me but I believe this in the, the, the weekend of the 22nd 23rd something like that and then also the St. Paul Center, uh, Scott Hans, uh, uh group are putting a conference just uh, for a few hours on Saturday, the eve of, or the day before Pentecost, Pentecost. Mm -hmm. on the Holy Spirit. So all of those will be free. And it's just beauty, solid doctrine. Um, and we want to make a transition that for in order for the theology of the body to make full effect for us to fully enter and what that that theology of the body that self-giving that sacrificial self-giving that we're called to there's some that needs to be there in our hearts and that's self-control that without self-control it's hard to give of oneself to the one that you love uh, ultimately to God but especially or not especially but in proximity to those that are near us right uh, and for that there's that, in order to gain self-control, there's a beautiful practice that the church has had for, since the beginning of its uh, origin. And that's called asceticism. Asceticism. Oh, do you want to tell us about what asceticism is? Well, we oftentimes hear people speak about, well, just control yourself. Um, and, and all of us who have had either a habit or something that we wish that we could eliminate from our lives realize that that is not something that can just be done at the snap of a finger most of the time and that that it requires a um, an orientation toward a way of toward a whole way of being toward a whole way of living which then leads to any number of, of life benefits but instead of using self-control, what we, we would call it self-mastery, which is being able to know one's self well enough to master one's um, uh, full expression as, as, a, um, as, a, as a natural creature, as a human being but also to work on, on mastering our relationship with our Creator, with the Divine. And anyone who knows um, anything about the history of the Church realizes that over the course of the centuries, many men and women, in an effort to seek out not only that, that understanding of self and self-mastery but also a deeper fuller un, um, um, you know a, a, a direct relationship with the divine have often entered into into radical um, uh, isolation if you will the the old the old desert fathers uh, who went who went singly out into the desert. That was men and women singly out into the desert to live. Um, and, uh, and those who adopted principles of, of life that we now call ascetic practices. 
And asceticism has sort of taken on this idea that it's somehow you have to be um, an unbathed, unshaven um, sort of a hermit or hermitess that, that can't deal with people and, and whatever that might come to our mind with regard to what it is to be an ascetic. That is not it. Because the three of us, and, and to an extent all of us as seeking Christians, have to adopt some form of what it is to be an ascetic in order to be able to achieve some degree of self-mastery and not just be little tumbleweeds blowing in the wind. Wherever the wind may blow us is where we go, and, and we become emotive, and, res and we only respond to stimulation rather than being internally responsive to divine movement through, through the work of the divine in us. And so, distilling it, asceticism is adopting practices that intensify and magnify our relationship with the divine, as well as intensifying and magnifying our understanding of our own being, and how we, if you will, move and have our being in the world. And, and with that understanding comes the ability to do such things as resist sin, um, to, to seek um, greater, greater divine intimacy, um, self-mastery, mastering ourselves in order to better uh, stay on the path, to better maintain that relationship with the divine. So there's a, always a very strong connection between the spiritual and the physical. Like, like we were talking about theology of the body, you can't separate the spirit from the body. So when it comes to the spiritual life, the physical and the spiritual are always interconnected. Like, everyone, in order to get a, a or to have a, a, like a body in shape, you know that it's required for you to have some sort of routine, of a workout routine, that will help you train, build muscle, and, and stay in shape. You know that the moment that uh, this whole quarantine started, you sit by the couch, you start losing muscle mass, you start losing all the, the resistance, the body, uh, uh, the body that you had, and then you become a little more round, right? And Is this, that right for you? <laughs> I'm afraid it has. Uh, for you too, or no? Not so much. I've been out walking all the time. But, but to build on what you're saying is, is um, focusing on why we're doing this. Even you know when you use the exercise experience, why is the exercise important? Understanding the piece above that first, and how our bodies are built, and understanding how God created us, and then based on that, the decision that yeah, it needs some exercise, it needs some careful diet, and then setting those pieces in place based on that ultimate uh, connection with God, rather than saying I'm going to just connect it here and and try to force the living of it. So the beauty about exercise is that when you do it, like it might be painful at first, and like when you start running or working out, or especially the, like those, uh, what what do you call those uh, crunches? Crunches and, and uh, <laughs> like stomach hurts. But you know that the more you do it, that there's a certain life that comes to you, like a certain motivation, a certain like sense of like you feel good, you feel great. Then you stop eating like less of the junk that you were eating. At least that's. That's my case. When I used to run, I haven't run in a while. But that, that's the experience that when you begin to work out, then automatically you start to like uh, not eat the unhealthy food that put you back in the, in the back seat. And so when it comes to the spiritual reality, it's very similar. That asceticism is that exercise that helps your spirit, your soul to be in shape. And that the more you do it, that the more you practice self-denial in order to be ready to give of yourself when the time comes, ultimately to God, but to the people that are around you as well. But the more you practice that self-denial, there's a certain joy that comes to you by knowing that, yes, I can love more, that yes, I can sacrifice for others, that yes, I have the potential, the ability to give of myself totally and fully to the ones that are 
that are in love, right? And if we truly love them, we want the best for them. And if we want to give the, uh, I want to sound like Matthew Kelly now, the, the best version of ourselves <laughs> for people to receive that. Like we want to give them the best. Yeah. And the spiritual exercises are for that. So that we tone and we shape our spiritual body, our, our spiritual souls, so that when it comes to God, we give of ourselves. Well, a very, um, very good and holy priest, um, who I'll just leave nameless for right now, had distilled it in such a way that made perfect sense when we were in the seminary. And he made the comment one day, he said, he said, brothers, garbage in, garbage out. And, and he was making a comment that, that seemed sort of crass, but at the same time, it was filled with truth. Because we, we see in our own lives, in our physical lives, that garbage into our bodies, whether it's, whether it's bad food, or whether it's uh, bad images, uh, pornography addictions, drug addictions, alcohol abuse, I mean, you name it, none of that ever produces anything other than garbage. It produces, it produces, if it's any fruit at all, it's rotten fruit. And the same is true theologically, where we decide that what we learned in fourth grade, which was the last time some of us were in, in catechism class, and that somehow we believe that that's going to inform us for the rest of our lives, which is a type of naivete that eventually bears some pretty bad fruit because then we go through our entire life with the view of our faith of a fourth grader or of an eighth grader or whenever it was that we were last exposed to any learning in the faith. And so part of the ascetic is is not so much, there is the denial part of it, but then there is the feasting part of it as well, that we must feast on what is good and, and what will fill us with goodness and rightness and virtue, which means what we look at, what we read, what we choose to, to bring, to bring into, into ourselves. And ultimately, that's the secret of many saints in the church that uh, the more they practice self-denial, that the more they were able to give of themselves to God and to the people around them. Um, like it's, it's, no, it's not by accident that almost every single saint in the church, if not all, have had some sort of like practice of fasting, of self-denial, even of some sort, like earlier in the church, of some sort of like physical... Uh, um, Mortification. Mort yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Um, of, uh, with that spirit of, of denying oneself so that one can be free to give oneself to God. Um, and so that's really the secret of the saints. Yeah, another way of looking at it is focus. To, you know, denying and forgetting that to focus on this, to move, make a, a purposeful decision to focus here mm -hmm. and to, to respond out of that, giving this up. And those are challenging. Those, those, can be, those can be hugely challenging. Absolutely. And the beauty of it that it's like the, the workout, right? That when you start, it's hard and you want to give up. And that's why you don't start with uh, marathons. You start with a couple meters. <laughs> yeah. So do we ask you what you're starting with? Uh, that's a topic for a different... Uh... <laughs> but, but what we would all agree with is that accountability is extremely important. Yeah. That what we find is that, that we may make personal resolutions that I'm going to do this by myself. And more often than not, we find that we do not have the capacity to do this by ourselves. That first and foremost, we need divine assistance, but we also need the assistance of those others because as we spoke about the other day, we are never churches of one. We belong to a communio, to a community. And part of being in community is the ability to be partners in charitable accountability to others. And, and in that way, we build each other up. Yep. Yep. And that's why if you go back to Ash Wednesday, when we rolled out Stewardship of Prayer, and we said, who's going to be your accountable partner? 
who are you going to connect with just to journey and to be accountable to the conversation? It makes a whole lot of difference when you know there's going to be a grade at the end when there's going to be something as a result of this and somebody that's tracking with you, somebody that's going to ask you about it. And it goes back to the idea that saints need saints, right? People that are on the same path, yep. like always striving to put God first at the center of your lives and then the rest flows. And it's like... <laughs> Like, there's no secret to the joy and the happiness of life with that. When you put God first, a lot of people might think, oh, that's boring, oh, God. But like that, when you live according to that, that's where like the true joy, the true fulfillment, the true happiness comes into your life. A happiness that is pure, a fulfillment that is total, like that is, is overwhelming when God becomes the center of your life. And when He doesn't, then we... See the reality of our world, that the majority of our world is not focused on God, and that when we don't focus on God, then we have a bunch of problems, a bunch of egos trying to fight against each other. That is not about someone else who loves us, but it's about who can I control. And this sense, too, that by denying ourselves or any of these quote-unquote ascetic practices, that somehow we are convinced that we become enslaved that we lose somehow liberty, when in reality it is exactly the opposite. Because to have the freedom to do, to choose to have the freedom to do whatever in the world we wish is no longer liberty, it becomes license. And license more often than not degrades into chaos because there is no order no structure, nothing, no accountability. And in the absence of that, um, many times lives will just, will just take their natural course and without order, everything in the universe spins out of control. Order provides stability. The lack of order leads to chaos, leads to, uh, to license. And that can be poisonous, if not fatal, uh, to, to us both as spiritual and many times as physical beings as well. And physically, if you never work out, if you do nothing to, to maintain your body, like it's a matter of time before it starts decaying and problems and pains and struggles. And spiritually, it's the same thing. It's no different. That if we do nothing to maintain our spiritual reality, then it will suffer, it will struggle. And when you start exercising, working out, the first thing that goes out is fat. And when you start like spiritually working out, you loosen up the, the, the spirit to act within you. It's like the, the so I, was, I was saying this, like this image of, of the spirit inside of us, when we don't do anything and, it, and we don't work it out, it's like a spirit that is like glued with fat to, <laughs> And then as you work it out, it's like it's, it's loosening up and it, it becomes free to act within you. Uh, that's a weird image. I it's a weird you image. You might move it to the sense that the, the fat is like sin. You need to let it go. It needs yeah. to drop off so you can truly be in shape for what you want. For sure. And it's all because it's life-giving. Uh, the workout is life-giving, as difficult as it might be. The spiritual life is really the ultimate life-giving. Is that communion with the Father in your heart. And my friends, if you haven't experienced that communion where you've missed it out, it's such a beautiful life-given experience when you come in contact with God. And many people will ask the question, well, how do we know anything about the ascetics? How do we know anything about the Desert Fathers? If they went off into the desert, they must have repelled anyone who wanted to come join them. Absolutely not. They may have gone to the desert but their lifestyle began to attract others who then went out and asked to be taught, who asked to, to learn from them. They were not isolated, selfish uh, hermits. They were profoundly, in their profound asceticism, they became profound givers and teachers of, of what, they, what they discovered. And that is why we can even speak of it today in, in terms of, of its 
um, uh, of its health and virtue. For sure. And we're out of time, but uh, as I read this comment by Daniel, talking about temple maintenance. Temple maintenance. Temple maintenance. Yep, yeah, I saw that. You, you yeah. reminded me of, yeah. uh, of an old friend um, who was a little bigger, who talked about that if the temple is a body of, uh, of the temple of God, the body of, where the spirit dwells, uh, he said, well, I'm going to build God a basilica in me. <laughs> Meaning yeah. that he was big because of the, the basilica he was building for God. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how it works. Do you but, not know that your bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit? Yeah. But that, again, that is as much spiritual as it is physical. Who's the architect of his temple? Himself, his food, or his God? I'll go uh, back and ask him. Yeah, go back and ask him that. Who, who's, who's your architect here? Oh, man. Who's got the design? Who's got the plan that you're working on? So with that, it's simply an invitation for all of us to dive deeper into the self-denial that ultimately will set you free and that it will lead you into a deeper love and to be able to love in a way that is much more profound, that is much more life-giving. That when we are free from ourselves, then we are free to love our Lord and the people around us. This is just a win-win situation for you, for your spouse, for your family, for us, for everyone, right? The more I lose myself and give myself to God, the more you guys benefit. Because then you'll be relating with someone who is joyful, who is happy, God willing, right? So well the priest without a sense of asceticism is is a is one in danger, um, in peril personal peril, and also as an ability to, to do anything of value for others. Absolutely. So, with that, should we close with a prayer? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with our hearts full of gratitude. Thank you for this beautiful weekend that we had. Thank you for the many teachings that you were able to give us through the Theology of the Body Conference. Thank you for our, our beloved mothers. Thank you for their love for their self-sacrifice that reflects your own love, that reflects your own desire to give up yourself to all of us. We ask that you may be with us, that you may pour abundantly and graciously your love and your mercy upon our families, upon our church, upon our world, especially those people that are sick, especially those that are suffering, those that are struggling. Be with them, love them, pour your Holy Spirit upon them, that through your powerful presence they may be healed, that in your name anything will press in them whether it's physical or spiritual, may be cast to the foot of the cross where it has been destroyed. Be with us. Help us to grow in our spirit. Help us to grow in a spiritual life that we may gain self-control to give ourselves totally to you. And through the powerful intercession of the Blessed Mother, we pray. Hail Mary, Mary full, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Good Health, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Francis of Assisi, pray for us. Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 8 o'clock tomorrow. Tonight, oh, uh, one final announcement. Uh, we've moved our evening prayer and rosary to 7 p.m. It will no longer be at 4, but now it will be at 7 that's what the majority of the people uh, thought it would be best on that survey that we did. So live at 7 on Facebook. Yep, 7 o'clock, starting today. Please join us if you're able. God bless you.